Okay, uh, welcome to the call. Um, I think this is going to be a fairly fine-grained call. Um, it might also be an inconclusive call. Um, the subject of this is simply things to do with scheduling, simply because there seem to be an awful lot of options regarding scheduling. Um, and I'm not sure, it seems like a very loose area for validation right now. Um, so I'm wondering if there's some way that we could tighten that up. Um, and Sorry, have you read the, um, the uh, or are we considering as part of this, the documentation on the, the open active uh, developers docs around scheduling? Uh, just checking that's being considered. Uh, which are you referring to there? Uh, developer docs on the left, there's a scheduling uh, thing, page, page yeah. which explains something about scheduling. Right, well, maybe we can talk about this actually in the call then. Um, no, I haven't okay. read that, or if I did, it was a long time ago and I can't remember it now. Okay, uh, no problem. So let's, uh, let's see here. Do, do. Um, sorry, I just need to be sharing something different here. Okay, you probably don't need to be looking at the JSON validator at the moment. Um, so um, the main point at issue is just, there seem to be a lot of ways of doing this. Um, you can have start time and end time, or rather start date and end date on the event itself. You can have a partial schedule, you can have an event schedule. Um, this is already a lot of variation. Um, and then it seems to me that the guidance in the spec is not terribly um, helpful, uh, except that this is the wrong issue, annoyingly. Um, sorry, we need 254. Um, Right. Um, you can also have, if you're using event schedule, you can then have start date, end date, start time, end time, and duration. Um, and then there's some variation in the data types that can be associated with each of these. Um, so start date and end date can both be dates or date times. Um, presumably if the former, you would then have to also supply start time and end time. Uh, these can also be date times or times. Um, so it feels like there's a lot of branching options there. Um, I guess. Um, sorry, uh, you, 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 sorry, just to check. Um, uh, we we definitely referring to the schedule when we say there's different options there, and not the event, because I thought the schedule was locked down a bit more, um, but that might not be the case. Um, well, okay, so I got all of this actually from the specification, from the open active specification, not from schema. Uh, yes, that's what that's right. So in, in the open active specification, the schedule is given a there's a a start date and an end date and a time and an end time. And those are defined uh, strictly start date and end date as dates and start time and end time are times. Um, within the event, there is an ambiguity where start date can be a time, a date time or a date. Um, and the event has a, a reason that's a problem for the event with which is triathlon is because they don't obviously capture start times as a whole. Um, okay, no, so, sorry, so can we segment the triathlon issue for a moment? Can we just leave that as a later discussion? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, of course. I, I guess what, what I meant was there that the... Um, uh, taking that issue aside and the, the event issue aside, which is all related to the event properties, the schedule properties themselves are uh, defined as in the spec as uh, start date and date is dates and start time and time is time. So it's, 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 it's fairly strictly defined. I realize I should have responded to this issue saying exactly that. <laughs> However, I have not uh, as yet, but, but yes, that's so I, I uh, I guess my question is, what is the ambiguity? That's my question, maybe to this issue. Um, I feel like there's there's two ambiguities. 
um, maybe just one, sorry. Um, the first is, so you can either put things in as an event schedule or directly on the event itself. Um, mm -hmm. This is presumably the case that you want to put the event schedule on parents and then generate children from them. Yeah. Um, is it worth defining this more tightly? Um, the scheduled sessions cannot, can they be specified as an event schedule or do they have to have start times and end times? Uh, the sh scheduled sessions can't contain a schedule. The right, okay. session series contains the schedule that generates the scheduled sessions. Right. And can a session series contain a start date, end time, etc.? Or do they, must they contain a schedule? Sorry, say, say, say that again. Well, okay, so child types can only contain start times and end times. Uh, so, so within the spec, this is really defined strictly around the uh, session series and the scheduled session stuff. Right. And, and there's, very cl there's very strict, uh, so if you look at, um, in the spec, if you look at 5.6.8.1, which is where the scheduled session and session series relationship is defined, Right. Okay. And, and so then if you scroll down to near the bottom of that section, there's a 4A scheduled session and 4A session series. And you can see that it says a scheduled session must not have an event schedule or, or, and or sub event. Um, and then in the session series uh, is where uh, that, that constraint doesn't exist. So you can do, so you can have the schedule in the session series, but not in the scheduled session. Right. However, so if you wanted to schedule, if you wanted to convey the time of a session series, um, you could have a start date and end, end date, which included a time. You could in the session series, that's right, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, or you could have an event schedule. Uh, yes, so I believe that the uh, session series start and end date. Let's see if we can. I really hope this is something that's clearly written somewhere because otherwise, uh, my uh, understanding of those properties is that that is a they are related to the sh session series itself. So the session series could start and end uh, on a given uh, date, right? But, but yes, exactly. But that's the series. So the series, for example, might go on for two months. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not, they're not going to be the same. Uh, the scheduled session doesn't inherit those properties. Right. But then should it be the case that the session series must have a schedule in that case, or I guess a schedule or sub event? Uh, yes. And I think it's the case. I think that's right. Uh, so uh, at least. Well, at least that's what the validator validates. Uh, no, I'm yeah. just checking for the, the text where that is uh, written. I'm hoping it's written here. Uh, session series intended, it must have, yes, it is. Okay, so three paragraphs, sorry, it's not, um, it's not in the same bullet points. Three paragraphs above the bullet points. As a session series is intended to be a parent event, it must have either an event schedule um, or uh, explicitly associated sub events. Okay, so it might be. I wonder if, for documentation purposes, it might be helpful to group that information um, slightly more. Yeah, yeah uh, so I, I mean, this is what I was going to say. So if you're looking at the developer site, there is a section on schedules which goes into some of this okay. um, and kind of has some specific examples there to clarify uh, what schedule generation is about. But I mean, basically, the, the main thing people seem to get confused about is the schedule rather than the partial schedule because the partial schedule is just kind of metadata this is every tuesday which people intuitively kind of get but um but the uh schedule is like a generated thing which has kind of there's there's a whole scheduling generation mechanism around that uh which is what this the documentation on the um developer site goes into right right so the, uh, the assumption is you'll read a scheduled session will not be supplied in that case, and the session series will can be used to automatically generate the scheduled sessions. 
well, in fact, the scheduled session can be supplied, but only to override. Uh, well, but but there's a there's a explicit overriding of the session series. So, using an example um, from Book When, uh, I think Book When team up and open sessions will implement this at the moment. So, um, in Book When, you have a, a schedule that might go on for months or years. There's no constraints around it, um, and uh, and then you might have some bookings made, uh, maybe in the next, maybe in the next week, maybe next two, three weeks. So those bookings are the number of spaces remaining, you know, um, remaining attendee capacity, those things. They're in the materialized, if you like, scheduled sessions, which are in the scheduled sessions feed. Um, but the session series um, is is going to go way beyond what's in the scheduled 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 session feed. So you might generate three months of events from the session series, but only override two of those um, from the, the scheduled sessions that are provided, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, hmm. So supposing you had a sort of arcane situation where you had the event schedule declared in the series and you had an exception to the rule also declared in that schedule. So you had a repeating rule plus an exception. These two Tuesdays, no class. Yeah. Um, then in the scheduled session feed, those two Tuesdays appeared. The uh -huh. semester for that would be ignore the exception rule in the session series. Yeah. So this is what the documentation clarifies, um, and I and I think the issue that was originally discussed, where where the semantics of schedules was discussed, had more detail in it. But I'm not sure it all made it into the specification around yeah. generation which is what that documentation kind of then additionally covers. Um, so that is, uh, that is that um, the, uh, the, it's basically a two-step process. If you're consuming the data, you first generate all the, the schedules, sorry, all the sessions, uh, scheduled sessions from the schedule. So step one, generate all the stuff. And then step two, get the things that have been uh, generated yeah. and sorry, that not generated from the feed and then override, uh, overwrite one with the other. Okay. Um, fair enough. Okay, good. Okay, so in fact, that's just my confusion, and I suppose the action on my, me would well, the action I guess would be possibly to introduce some more of that into the specification. Um, yeah. Well, I I think there's actually another question which is related to this which is a is a problem which only really comes up in booking but has how uh, we've already come across this in the booking stuff um which relates to the interplay between schedules and some of the booking features that rely on ids being the same because the schedule generates identifiers uh for every um, generated session uh, scheduled session um but those identifiers are the same identifiers that are because obviously if it's generating them from the time those identifiers must include the time in them date time in them um but those identifiers are the same identifiers that are used for the opportunity um uh update notifications so if someone moves a scheduled session from you know 7 to 8 p.m and it's a generated one the problem we have is that the id that's being used to generate those actually encodes the time in it. So if you move the event, you actually create a new event because you've changed the ID. Um, and you put which a... it, well, that's hugely problematic for booking because booking relies on that ID for all the previous bookings that have happened in the past and also uh, for all the bookings that have been are being made in the future. Um, and so the changing of that ID is a challenge. And there's a, there's a GitHub issue that discusses this in the booking spec already um, and one of the suggestions in that github issue is to do what team up do which is something called versioning the schedule um, and so basically you create a version you, you basically uh, mandate that the the id that's generated doesn't just include a date time as the open sessions version does um, but it also includes the version of the schedule it was generated from mm -hmm. So basically, let's say that you generate version one of the schedule generates 7 p.m. on a Tuesday. 
those IDs exist and people start booking against them. If you change that, the way you need to do that then is you, if you change the schedule, you change the schedule so it's now 8 p.m. What you do is you maintain the version one IDs for those events. Um, but when you create version two of the schedule, if there's any bookings for anything that exists at the moment, you've then got to exclude those bookings from version two. So exclude, sorry, those dates from version two. So effectively at that point, what you're saying is version two of the schedule is um, excluding the dates that were previously materialized by version one. So that version one IDs can still exist. And then what you're really doing is you're, re you're then rescheduling the version one stuff um, to, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. But the ID will obviously still say 6 p.m. because it was generated by version one when that was what that was. And then it was kind of detached and moved. Um, so basically gets really complicated. And this is why when we had that whole conversation about facility use uh, a while ago, uh, or maybe it was a few, maybe it was even last week, I don't know. We talked about having, you know, schedules generating stuff for one-to-one -one sessions. And I, I mentioned then that there was all kinds of problems with schedules because it's easy in some ways to just quickly generate a schedule and get the data out. But as soon as you get into any of the edge cases, uh, that follow that you are in a world of complexity that makes it actually easier often not to use schedules and just to materialize the scheduled sessions um because if you're materializing scheduled sessions based on an id that is your internal identifier for your database then everything's easy because it doesn't matter what date they're on doesn't matter when you reschedule them that is a more natural fit to whatever your internal structure you have um as opposed to uh yeah, this kind of crazy like generating stuff and then you're being stuck with the generated IDs that you then got to port around at different versions and all sorts of things. So, so I almost wonder whether it will be the case that for implementations that, imp that do booking, whether they move away from schedules towards materialization um, and a combination of materialization and partial schedules instead of dealing with all the complexity of trying to have material, ha have schedules with reliable IDs, basically, like that was the that was the dream when this original from the original GitHub issue on the subject was have these IDs that are just uh, and they're generated and that's fine. But yeah, like I said, as soon as you have to rely on those IDs, as you should with a JSON LD ID. Yes, IDs uh, <laughs> <laughs> really crucial to the whole operation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and this is tricky because this is genuinely a specification problem. I mean, if the, the IDs are incorrectly allocated or incorrectly tracked, um, everything breaks. Um, so it yeah. In the spec. This is it. Yeah, completely. Um, so the, there is an ID template in the spec, which is defined for this purpose. And it says the properties required if data providers are uh, supporting third party booking via open booking API. So the modeling spec already references the yet to be finished open booking API with this intention. Um, it's just, I, I guess, the challenge with finalizing this spec, what is it, two years before the yeah, booking API gets finalized? Yeah, two years before is that a lot of the nuances that have now come out of the booking API implementations and the, and the, the reference implementation and all the, all the tooling stuff, which has been really useful, um, haven't been taken into account here. So uh, yes, we, we're now in a situation where we're having to document, heavily document, uh, which, which is part of what that stuff in the developer docs does, some of these workarounds so that it's clear what, um, what one should do if you want to actually conform to the spec and use those schedules still, which I think, I think is interesting because I think Bookwen's preference from the beginning has definitely been to use the schedules over everything else because they don't materialize anything in their database mm -hmm. until it's booked. And so they have really had that strong preference and um, team up with the same, same exact thing. They don't materialize anything until it's booked. Um, and so it is a natural fit in some ways. Um, but the problem is, of course, that when you book a team up thing or you book an open sessions thing, in the background, there's an ID generated that is then used throughout the whole process. Right. And the way that we have the open booking stuff all work is that those IDs are already published openly in advance of the booking beginning. So you can't like switch up the ID at C1, for example, like, hey, you've given me this ID from the open feeds, but actually now I've made a booking, I'm going to materialize it. So now you need that ID, you know, you need to use this ID going forward. Um, which, I mean, I guess we could do that type of thing in the booking spec to solve this problem and actually allow you to 
materialize the ideas as you go um then you have a well i mean you have a slightly different type of problem then because your logic has got to deal with ids that are being a, a changing basically as you go which yeah it's problematic both directions okay um <laughs> sorry that was like here's a load of problems <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah well i guess i guess it's just about isolating them in a way because i would like in a sense to have the same guidance for identifiers simply in the opportunity spec and the booking specification it'd be nice to be able to have the same guidance but it sounds like actually that could be inflicting pain <laughs> um yeah well I, I suppose the thing is we're trying to make these these identifiers last because that's jason ld kind of yeah. way and so that I suppose is where the challenge of uh generating generating ids i suppose itself is i suppose implicitly a bit of a challenging idea mm -hmm. but um yeah because i mean the other way you yeah the other way you, you i suppose you could do it is you is those ids don't ever exist right like anywhere and so um yeah i guess i guess this is where you get into like i want to book this event at this start time and please materialize it type type logic which it, it isn't really how everything is, is built mm -hmm. but, but yeah but i mean i guess i guess having c1 reflect back the ids that it's a, uh, it's actually using isn't the craziest idea to be fair because we've already got positions in there in the order items so i guess as long as you're able to as a data consumer, remember the thing that you said you were going to book or set out to book before it materialized it. Um, that's probably the closest to the actual underlying implementation um, and reduces the, and then all we say is that, you know, it, we don't recommend that you use any generated identifiers uh, in your booking logic to, um, to do anything. I suppose then what would need to happen is the ID for the, yeah, this is the really hairy thing. So you would then have the same RPD ID for an item, but you've just changed its JSON LD ID because you've just materialized it. Um, or that type of idea. Or, yeah, well, yeah, I guess you've just introduced a new, uh, yeah. Um, you've introduced a new I item in the scheduled sessions feed. And then you've probably got to you've probably got to have a uh, exclusion that also gets created at the same time in the schedule, so it doesn't overwrite it. Um, it sounds to me like the complexities are not yet fleshed out of this. Agreed. Uh, so what we've done, we've done, we've got at the moment. There's an issue in booking which has this problem in it. Um, no one's yet tried to solve this, as in no one's tried to make anything work using this using booking. Uh, Obviously, all the tests, etc., are built expecting the uh, feeds to include. Uh, sorry, it's not obvious. The tests currently assume materialization. The tests don't allow for booking of anything that's scheduled. So, uh, I guess that's the thing. At some point, we're going to have to. You know, we're going to have to, to cross that bridge. And I guess when that happens, we maybe build a couple of extra tests and, and bits of the reference implementation that then do schedules. Um, and then figure out how we actually implement that um, as we go along. So have you got that GitHub issue for reference? It's on it's in the booking? Yeah, uh, let me find the booking. Uh, mm. Uh, it's number 138, I think, and it references uh, 139, and, uh, and the test suite issue 123. Uh, test suite issue is a, an issue to uh, suggest that the test suite does this generation, because it doesn't currently do that. Uh, 139 is, uh, Nathan's actually commented on 139 already. Um, yeah. 
back in August about dereferencing and feed retention uh, and and these are related to uh, schedule generation uh, stuff. I guess what I was really hoping for is that one of the pilots would start to solve this problem so we could really get into the detail of it but I wonder whether the thing to do to solve this is uh, probably get Bookwen team up open sessions on a call because they've all got the same problem and discuss which of the two solutions we've outlined which are basically versioning your set versioning your schedule or uh, having these IDs that are fake and become real would be the most useful. Maybe some data users as well on the same call who are going to then have to, so maybe get PlayFinder, for example, on the same call. So I think we need to do this sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, I think, I definitely, I think this, this is probably something we need to handle before we finish, finalize uh, the booking spec, to be honest, because um, without it, I mean, PlayFinder, it's going to be hypothetical because they only deal with facilities that don't include schedules. Um, but at least I know Nathan will probably have a, a view on uh, how they might have thought about it. And obviously, I'm in can be another one um, just in terms of thinking about because IDs changing. I mean, I don't know if anyone from Open Data uh, Services wants to jump in on this as well because I know they had problems with IDs already. Um, but the idea that we might have IDs that change in the feed could. I can see there being conceptual problems with that that yeah. we probably don't want. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to fully flesh out the implications of. So the versioning is probably intuitively an easier solution in terms of the spec, but from an implementation perspective, I, but then also, to be honest, from an implementation perspective, it might not be that difficult because versioning is something that team up already do. I don't know if book when do, but you've already got a, a schedule object usually in your database. So we're just talking about adding versions to that. I think it's a hairy one. I think the philosophical point is a tricky one. I, mm. It's, yeah. I mean, I guess my one question that comes to mind is if something goes wrong with this process, how do you track back what happened? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keeping a real minefield of like somewhere in our database. <laughs> um, yeah, well, this is the thing. I mean, changing IDs is probably, uh, I mean, no one's going to, I feel like that's kind of dragon's territory, yeah. isn't it? Um, uh, especially in a, in a, you know, potentially globally distributed system. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> all kinds of problems. Yeah, I think there's a reason why it's a basic tenet of the, of the philosophy. Um, <laughs> you don't do that, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, therefore, uh, Probably versions, but then, as you say, there's there's so many edge cases to that. I mean, you, you know, there's there's a whole extra section of the test suite of, or whatever needs to probably cover various different situations where you might reschedule something, and so therefore something else needs to be, uh, yeah, what exclusions apply, making sure that all of that works. Um, Okay, let's yeah. make that the next call then, because um, I, I feel like uh, yeah, it's possible to imagine alternatives sort of indefinitely, um, and but also impossible to foresee all the difficulties. I think yeah, meant to, to enough eyes, all bugs are maybe not shallow, but at least um, can be seen. Mm. We're not there at the moment. Um, sure. And the question that I was raising was much much simpler. Um, so <laughs> sorry. Uh, oh no! Well, no, it's, it's. I mean, it's really useful to surface all this. Um, I'm just thinking. Yeah, it's just, just not soluble in kind of uh, current. Uh, yeah. Time frame or well, without without. Yeah, yeah agreed. Basically. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, however, um, and I'll, I'll, I feel like the problem we're solving with this one is more just my own my own ignorance. Then, um, yeah, looking at the opportunity spec. Um, yeah, so I see that actually we are tighter than uh, schema.org is, so most of this isn't as problematic. Um, I guess my only other question would be partial schedule. Why do we, what's partial schedule doing that we can't do with like scheduling note or something within event schedule? <laughs> yes. Uh, this uh, was a debate that lasted for some time. 
Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> and uh, various model implications. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, basically, the problem that partial schedule solves, and and is and it's quite widely used actually, partial schedule, okay. is that very often you have a situation where there is very useful information available for an event, but the information isn't complete mm -hmm. from a kind of temporal technical sense. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, you might know that an event happens at 7 p.m. every Tuesday, mm -hmm. but and that's really useful for a consumer to know that information. And obviously very common that that every Tuesday information might be present in some form in a database, which is why there's, this is quite a popular um, property and type however it's not every tuesday in the semantic sense of the those words so it might not happen at christmas it might not happen at you know easter it might not happen at whatever like it doesn't mean every tuesday can rain or shine we will absolutely be running on that track because you know yeah. so many things happen that mean that doesn't that's not the case including you know COVID-19 or whatever has come up. Um, so those things we'll still see every Tuesday, even though maybe that, that every Tuesday session has been canceled for, for some time. Um, and so that's useful, uh, but it's not, uh, enough, it's not enough to generate sessions from. And so the, the subtle semantic difference between these two things is that uh, partial schedule is something that says every Tuesday, uh, you can render it like that in the, in the front end, you should render it as every Tuesday. Um, what you should not do is extrapolate it to next Tuesday and put a date on it right. because, because that's misleading the user. Um, however, with a schedule, you can absolutely do that because that's the point of the schedule and its, and its exceptions. Um, so with the schedule with accept, date, with, um, with accept dates, you can say, uh, yeah, it will definitely happen this next Tuesday because the schedule has said it will and therefore it will. And it's probably bookable at that time. Um, so, they, so, and that's, and so obviously, ideally, all our open data would be of the more solid schedule type. Um, and so, what, what we really have in, in, if you look at kind of the data that's been made open so far, is you have three different types of data. You have data where every single session is materialized, and that's the only type of information you have. So, all I can say is it's next Tuesday and the Tuesday after. I can't say every Tuesday. I just know the next two Tuesdays are definitely happening. That's the first type. The second type, the most common type, is you have uh, some materialized stuff combined with a partial schedule. And so that's saying next Tuesday and the following Tuesday are definitely happening, and it's every Tuesday most of the time. Sure. So, I mean, that, that makes sense. So one is machine actionable and one's not, basically. Um, but is... Is partial schedule basically there for human readability? I mean, is that really the only thing that you can do with partial schedule is render it in some way? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just human readable, it's machine readable to the extent that if you had a calendar, as um, some front ends do, where you have, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday events, you can allocate this event into one of those columns with accuracy, because the partial schedule says it happens on a Tuesday. Okay. And you can also, if you've got, a, uh, depending on your calendar view, you can also say this happens after another thing because it's, it's eight o'clock on a Tuesday. Um, so those things make it more useful than just text. Okay. Um, there was, the schedule note was added after um, to, count, to cover things like people wanting to write that this doesn't happen at New Year and Christmas, but most of the time it does. Um, but basically, I guess the reason I was enumerating those different types of um, of data sources because we've been kind of saying that there's a gold standard here which is that we want to have real actionable data uh if that's with a schedule or without it doesn't matter as long as you can guarantee that next tuesday's event is happening so if you don't have that actionable data then a consumer doesn't know whether they can turn up or not without making a phone call yeah. and that's what we're trying to get away from with all of this um open active stuff so um, that's the gold standard and all data currently published except for two data sources has that so all data currently published has either uh, it will happen at this time or this day, um, or 
it, 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 there's, a, and there's a schedule which says exactly when it will happen. Um, the only two day sources that don't do that and do the kind of not gold standard like second, this might happen on a Tuesday, but you probably need to call ahead or check the website because we don't know. And the data was probably updated six months ago stuff is EMD. EMD has two data sources that do that. And those two data sources are uh, in the process of being phased out in favor of that gold standard. I mean, Jade could explain a lot if she was on the call around this whole thing, but uh, this gold standard for them is about making sure that book when all the sessions are book of all sessions are actually happen. So on class finder, when they show you a session, that's definitely a session you can just turn up to and attend. Um, which means that we're kind of moving away from partial schedules on their own. Mm. However, partial schedules on their own are used, sorry, partial schedules in conjunction with materialized or actionable um, events are used for all the kind of leisure operators, for example, Gladstone implements it, Legend implements it, others implement that because the, it's very common to have a Tuesday at eight o'clock class for a leisure center. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in, and you want that information in combination with the actionable events. Okay. Um, no, that's useful. I was hoping there would be a way we wouldn't have to support one or the other, um, but <laughs> that's clearly not the case. Um, uh, okay, that's useful. Uh, status quo, fine. Um, so, okay, so just with a few minutes left, um, and I really only raised this as a kind of attempt to kick something back into play. So this is the uh, issue that you alluded to earlier, uh, which is about variable durations, basically estimated durations, um, situations in which the length of time of something is not known, which also somewhat ties into situations where the date or the time of something is not known more generally, like in the case of British Triathlon, where things like start dates and end dates are difficult to specify. Um, we discussed this on a previous call, like something like eight months ago, seven months ago. Um, mm -hmm. It sort of ran into the sand, and I was hoping we would pick this up again on the um, on the thread uh, that did not happen. Um, so I just raised two ideas there, more as a way of kind of getting the discussion going and kicking the tires, and hopefully th through critique, um, refining the issue a little bit, um, because it does seem difficult that there are a lot of um, activities like park run, like triathlon, where actually you can't, you know, the, the duration is, or marathons, um, the duration is, is quite variable. Um, and it seems odd that we can't ingest that. Um, so I just made two very simple suggestions at the end of the thread, one of which was we've got indicative duration in the root specification. Uh, which works like duration, except that it's a complex object um, and it's got an activity associated with it. Um, so yes, it takes, indicatively, it takes two hours to run it, four hours to walk it, um, you know, 50 minutes to horse ride. Um, the other would be simply um, retain everything as it is except improve the guidance on scheduling out to say if you if you know if the start time is 10 but actually you're staggering uh race times from 10 until 11 30 you know just indicate that information in the scheduling out we really do need to have some kind of start time from you um it seems like beyond that there's not really any way of reconciling the the demands that are given in the summary from the previous call um The, there's so many front ends that are based on the idea of having a start time and an end time that it seems difficult to see how we can really intelligently support uh, vagueness in this area, even if vagueness is, is the reality of, of the situation. Mm, I can't remember from that last call what the main pushback to just implementing this beta property as is was. Um, because as if you just if you exclude end date and just have start date and estimated duration i mean start date plus estimated duration um because i think end date's already optional isn't it uh, i think 
Um, yeah, I think the issue appears really in the sense is about how queries are written, basically. Um, right. So locking an end date um, was just seen as complicating things a bit, basically. Um, So, hang on. So um, I'm just catching up. So the recommend. Okay. So end date is recommended, yeah. and they should and it, and publishers should recommend it either provided an end date or duration. Obviously, ideally both. Start date is required. So, but the estimated duration. But what's the issue with estimated duration then? Because. Uh, I mean, the only pushback I can imagine, I mean, so the, the one is uh, simply that it complicates writing queries a little bit, that the logic becomes more, more convoluted. Um, but that might just be an inescapable feature of the domain. The other is that actually Parkrun apparently um, just doesn't like specifying. Um, that it's yeah, I've heard, I, I remember having that conversation with them. Um, but that's, but that, that's fine because I mean, all Parkrun is saying is we don't want to give you an end date or a duration, which apparently, well, according to the spec is completely fine because not all events have a well-defined end date. And so all this is saying is for those cases where there's not a well-defined end date or duration, um, you still need a, you've got a start date. So add a estimated duration optionally, uh, which is, um, Maybe there's. Um, well, the other I, issue was that possibly a range might be need, might be better. That was the other objection raised. Well, I think I think well I think the beta property is already a range, from what I can remember. I think it's on the on the issue. And maybe Pete, Pete's point was that the um, that there might be a, a you might want to keep end date, end time. Sorry, yeah, end date and estimated duration for that driving lesson example where things must finish by a certain time. But I did. I mean, I don't know. Hey, again, without all these people back on the call to talk about it, it's difficult to uh, to uh, have the full conversation. But I mean, I wonder whether we just. Um, I mean, this beta property is already there and in use. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it? And We've got instances of this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Pete raised it because it was in the LTA data, uh, or in oh, sorry, the running data, the athletics data. Um, so I, I mean, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think the semantics we've got are are fine. If we've already got a situation where the start date is the only required field and end date is, is in fact optional, then all we're doing really is adding additional metadata where it wasn't there before, saying there's an estimated duration. We're not really, I mean, if there's a challenge here about, about end date not being present, which is what uh, that 12th of February comment seems to be saying, then that's, that's kind of already a problem, right? Uh, as in, we don't have an end date in every case currently. And so from Parkrun's perspective, that's 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 correct. Like that's yeah, yeah. that's what they that's what they would that's what they'd expect. They don't publish an end date themselves because it varies as by the participant. So uh, so that yeah, so I don't see what the complexity here then is. I mean, if we want to mandate an end date, that's a different conversation, and it sounds like there's a fairly strong case to not do that based on some of the data publishers and and their own customer behavior which they're aware of um and so if it's not about making an end date mandatory we're really just introducing an additional property which is just as as with the partial schedule is is a useful machine readable property that can be used to sort things and to filter things um, but really just a indicator not designed to do anything other than inform people. Yeah, I guess, um, I mean, what's your view on data consumers actually implementing against this? Or is, is anybody parsing estimated date, uh, estimated duration right now? Um, the only organization I can think of that was interested in doing this was part of the uh, Open Active Accelerator cohort. Um, I don't think they're actually using open data at the minute. Okay. They might be though, because the athletics data they might be using. Let's see. Um, I can't remember, they're called run something. 
Rowan Friendly? Not sure. I don't think so. Um, let's have a quick look. Find a race. So find a race, uh, which see if they still will go. They're uh, still going. Uh, so find a race. Have all the races you can uh, you can find. And then I guess the question is, are they using open data? Because they were thinking about it. Um, and so let's see. Um, Uh, running, yeah, maybe it's because the races that they're looking at were too small. Um, the one, sorry, the data that they got from from uh, England Athletics was they're not races in the same sense, but they do list all the park runs. Hmm. So they're getting that data somehow. Maybe they're scraping it. So that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, well, and actually with Perkman, you wouldn't have to scrape very much, would you? Uh, no. Uh, and I'm just looking at what they've got in there, a park run, and they haven't got an end date. Um, they've just got... They've just got a link. So, I mean... Yeah, so they must be scraping that. So yeah, so I mean, Parkrun, um, I know that they're, they're on the list somewhere to do the open data stuff, and they are the reason for part of this. But yeah, they, I mean, they don't, they don't use it at present, this estimated thing, but then it's not in Parkrun data, so uh, maybe let's have a look at another one. I guess, I guess the, 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 the thing is that this data is really more about running and cycling than it is about other things. Yeah. So. I think probably the question is, do these current, do, do the places where you look at this information currently include that? Um, they also include distances though as well. You know, di distance is maybe more important than estimated time because when you're looking for a run, you're looking for the distance usually, right? So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was an extended conversation about that. It sort of depends on, yeah, where you are on your fitness journey um which which data point you consider more relevant um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um okay well so find a race doesn't allow you to search by duration and time it only allows you to search by distance um and uh the same is true of uh run together um so i mean yeah and run together actually doesn't include on their own website presently an estimated uh, time just puts the uh, just puts the distance okay the estimated so, duration. so it's, it seems like the difficulty then is actually more that the kinds of data consumers we have right now are the, the estimated duration belongs to a different domain um than most open <sighs> well i mean potentially I don't know. I, well, I wonder with this, I mean, unless anyone's cr crying out for it, whether it makes sense to leave it as a beta property until we've got more people using it, which I guess is why I was there to see if, you know, people, if the data gets published, see if people pick it up. Um, yeah. So I don't know if it does it. I don't know if there's any, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't appear that there's any particular um, urgency to promote it at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, which I guess is an indication of also that the thread sort of slightly died. <laughs> it's, um, it's like okay. Um, yeah, yeah, completely. I mean, it's 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 interesting. I think I think what we what we've got here is a situation where when you're publishing data, you obviously want to publish as much as possible. So we we add beta properties where we can if there's data that exists to make it to make it available, and then when that data gets consumed, those business questions happen. You know, what do we want to display? What's the user experience? And obviously we always try and promote when people publish data to publish as much as they can because you don't know what innovative stuff people are going to come up with and what they will need and publishing more data after the fact as we know is very <laughs> unlikely to happen slash uh, 
is is a long process and usually won't happen quick enough for campaigns or whatever needs to use it so yeah i guess some of these beach properties exist because of our publish everything philosophy and i guess the point is they don't need to be formalized until there's more traction it's just about establishing some convergence okay so that's another status quo ante kind of situation um hooray back to the beginning um <laughs> and i guess the next so i guess yeah the, the next point is simply to get a lot of people on the next call so we can deal with the id problem which is one feature of how schedules work but not directly um related um yeah, I have to think about how we do that. Um, because uh, Matt, who would be the best person from team up is in America. Um, so I wonder if whether we should, um, and what I'm wondering is whether a call is the best way of doing that or whether we should just have a robust proposal in GitHub and get comments on it from those folks. Because I know that Joe is also, uh, I think made a point in the history of these calls never to actually join uh, from Book when, although he's always happy to contribute ideas. So I don't know whether, given that Joe and, and, and Matt are going to have probably the most to say on the subject, uh, and they won't be, uh, they're unlikely to join. Um, well, Matt won't because of the time difference, and I guess Joe sure, sure. is unlikely to. So maybe, maybe actually, um, yeah. If we if we make if we make a like a robust uh, proposal based on that, at the moment that issue really just says, "Ha, there's a load of problems here." Yeah. Um, <laughs> if we, if, <laughs> this will be fun to solve at some point. Um, maybe we uh yeah we we moved to solving that um sure especially I mean, it doesn't seem like the kind of it, it's quite complicated to discuss live anyway um yeah that's okay. it and so but then my next the next thinking on that though is that in terms of the urgency on that point it is it is key to get that done obviously before we finalize the spec but also given we're working through various other things on the spec presently I know one of the live debates, uh, just looking at the Slack and GitHub over the last few um, days has been around the, um, or weeks has been around the uh, lease, the number of, of spaces that you have in, a, in the feed versus the number of spaces that you have um, in the calls and how that works for leasing and for, for booking. So there's some of that, That's those discussions are already happening on GitHub and I know that seem to be converging in terms of uh, various feedback on some stuff there but um uh, yeah i wonder whether it's worth doing this just a bit later when we've got these other bits out of the way um i guess that leads to another question is the original topic scheduled for this date was actually changes to the booking spec um because i think you had a few sort of in the backlog uh, yeah but it sounds like that should be held off again given yes still to come down the pike I think, yeah, I think, especially as we, we've, we're kind of now doing extra work with P and there's more feedback around that to hopefully come, um, that, yeah, maybe it makes more sense to, um, yeah, to, 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 because at the moment they're all tagged. Uh, so anyone that's watching this that wants to, to check them out, so, uh, CR3 issues are all tagged in the, in the open booking repo as they come up uh they're, they're, they're there so and i know that nathan for example has been really good at commenting them as they as they come up and um there's some live discussions there waiting to happen so um there probably does need to be a process of probably going through those pro those issues many of which are suggestions for things uh proposing something concrete on ones where they're just kind of like ah this is a problem um, and a discussion and then probably uh, a call where we kind of try and get as many useful uh, as many sorry useful people people who are, who are doing this live on the call as possible so that you know they are able to contribute what they've thought uh, from the various implementations um, maybe gladstone and legend as well and just kind of hammer through the the cr3 changes a bit and just say you know this is we're going to we're just going to summarize all the things we're proposing here uh, that are kind of remotely major uh, to be fair because a lot of them are more semantic points which i imagine don't require much discussion but more just a signpost mm -hmm. uh okay yeah um well it sounds like that's actually several weeks away if not months away um in terms of the amount of hashing out that has to occur first before that call can sensibly be held um yeah, yeah. okay um okay. 
agree with that. My internet bandwidth is telling me that it's time to wrap up the call. Sorry, I, I cut out. Um, oh. Well timed. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll say thanks, Nick, in case we get cut off again. Um, and yeah, uh, essentially nothing to be done on those issues, I think, except for some maybe some guidance and documentation work. Um, yeah, I definitely suggest checking out the um, the schedule do documentation that's on the uh, on the de developer stuff and see if there's anything. I know there's already been a bug raised and resolved against that um, last week. So, um, uh, but yeah, if there's any more uh, comments on that, obviously, that's okay. useful. Okay, thanks a lot, Nick. Okay.